Okay, I think the recording is starting. Okay, so welcome to TED Colloquium today. And our speaker today is uh, Santana Day. Um, Santana is a professor of industry and systems engineering at uh, Georgia Tech. Um, he obtained PhD from um, Purdue University. And afterwards he uh, worked as postdoc at uh, Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. Um, Santana worked on non-convex optimization and uh, in particular mixed integer and linear and non-linear programming and their applications in engineering. Um, so today he's going to talk about sparse PSD approximation of the PSD con. Uh, thanks, 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 Jane, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, this is uh, it's great to uh, great to be uh, virtually visiting uh, Waterloo and. Uh, so this is uh, this is joint work with with uh, Greg Brickerman, who's uh, who's in the math department at 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 at, at Georgia Tech, and Marco Molinaro, who's at uh, the computer science department at Book Rio, mm -hmm. uh, and took a Shu and Shending Sun, who are PhD students uh, in our ACO program. Actually, they they are from the their home departments are in math. Um, so, so, uh, 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 so, you know, Jay, thanks for the kind uh, introduction. Jane. So as Jane mentioned, most of my work actually has been in integer programming. Uh, and and today I've been looking a little bit at uh, sort of non-convex, continuous non-convex problems. Uh, and so in some sense, this is a really new topic for me. It's about, uh, it's about DPs, which is, uh, I, I always think of SDPs as, as a black box. And, and so my knowledge is in some many ways limited here. So I would appreciate all the feedback I can get. Uh, so what are SDPs? What is semi-definite program? Everyone uh, knows in this audience, but just to just set, to set the notation. Uh, this is essentially a class of convex programs where you're thinking of thinking of your variable X as, as, as a matrix variable and your objective is linear in, 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 in the variables, your constraints are linear. And additionally, what you require is that this matrix should be in the PST code. So when I say linear with matrix, I mean, you know, uh, with respect to this sort of trace uh, trace product, you know, and you know, all data, everything is symmetric matrices. So that's that's is in our product. And when I say PST, what I mean, I mean, you know, the class of matrices that are symmetric. And when you evaluate the quadratic form, this is non-negative, right? So and 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 and. Uh, you know, there's very beautiful class of polynomial time algorithms for these problems, and they're fundamental in the sense that, you know, for most integer programming and sort of, let's say, QCQPs, uh, quadratically constrained quadratic problems that are non-convex, you can construct these semi-definite programming relaxations that are, uh, the, I mean, they are also fundamental in building these sort of hierarchies, uh, which eventually get to the convex hull of these convex problems. And so, semi-programming, uh, I mean, and there are other applications, but at least from my perspective, they are very fundamental and important. Uh, the problem with them is that even though they are uh, polynomial time solvable, uh, sometimes you know you're not able to actually sort of scale that, get that scaling in practice with with with, with commercial solvers, uh, general purpose SDPs. So uh, so 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 what can you? Do? There are lots of different things that you can do. One of the things that you know I have recently seen that kind of works for some of the problem working on is to take this problem and further relax it. And the way we've been looking at relaxations is that <clears throat> instead of enforcing that a matrix is PST, uh, what you enforce is that some k by k principal sub matrix of this matrix is PST. And 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 you know. The, 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 so the property of a PSD matrix, well known, we all know, is that if a PSD matrix uh, uh, is PSD, then these k by k principal sub matrices have to be, right? Uh, and 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 so therefore this is this is an implication, and this, this second problem here is a relaxation. Uh, and if you, these k's are not too large, and if there are not too many of these sub matrices, just giving this relaxation to these commercial solvers sometimes just helps you solve them faster. Of course, at the cost of you know, not getting the same bounds. Uh, there's another perspective that why I like this sort of this this relaxation, which uh, which is which is the sort of cutting plane point of view. So imagine if you wanted to solve SDPs using cutting planes, how would you do? Well, you would maintain the sort of the linear structure of the problem, so you would ignore 
the fact that the matrices have to be PSD. So you will try and minimize the linear function over linear constraints. And so when you solve that LP, you would get a matrix X. Uh, the problem would be that the matrix X would not be a, a PSD matrix. So what can you do? Uh, well, one trick is you just try and sort of spare the position of this matrix. Uh, and, and you take the eigenvectors corresponding to the negative eigenvalues. Uh, you take, uh, you can take, uh, think of taking, let's say the outer product of these eigenvectors. You get these round matrices such that the trace product between this rank one matrix and your current X should be less than zero. But for any PSD matrix X, trivially has to be greater than or equal to zero. So you can cut off your, cut off your current uh, uh, sort of infeasible X, uh, the X which is feasible to your LP constraints, but not to your, to your PSD constraint. At this cut, this is a linear inequality, resolve P and, and, and repeat. And, 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 and so one could implement this. And one of the biggest challenges when you implement this is the fact that most of the times these eigenvalues, the, uh, the eigenvectors, pardon me, that you get are dense vectors. So, so just to put it in perspective, even if your matrix was say 100 by 100 by 100 matrix variable, your eigenvector was a n equals to 100 vector, uh, you know, when you do this outer product, you get, a, you get these uh, matrix with, 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 with 10,000 non-zero entries essentially. And so when you add this linear inequality to, to this linear program, you add a very dense inequality. And, and, and linear programming solvers are extremely good, extremely robust, but they prefer if your data is sparse. So doing this, if I actually enforce this, I only enforce these K by K principal sub matrices, and I try and separate cuts from only these K by K sub matrices, uh, the linear inequalities that I would add would be very sparse, and, 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 and that can help in computations. So let me just quickly show you <clears throat> just one uh, sort of uh, not a very scientific uh, uh, argument to say that this might not be such a bad idea, but this is a paper in the works. So it should be, we should be finishing it very soon. So this is together with uh, Alex, uh, Andrea Lodi, uh, Gonz uh, uh, Gonzalo Munoz and myself. And, and, and what we've done is we've taken various classes of QCQP, uh, non-convex uh, quadratic problems, and looked at their SDP relaxations. And, and actually, you know, we've tried to solve them, you know, instead of using cutting planes, but instead of actually enforce, trying to get cuts from the whole sort of PSD-ness of the whole matrix, we try and get cuts from the sort of K by K sub matrices. So that is, uh, that is what is going on here. And, 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 and in this figure, uh, this is time. And this is sort of the gap closed uh, with respect to the dense cuts and sparse cuts. And you see that the sparse cuts are doing far better and, and so if you have limited time, you know, sort of trying to solve these SDPs using these sparse cuts. And, 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 and why is this happening? Uh, there's nothing magical about these sparse K by K sub matrices and the implications of them, the linear implications from them. It's just that the LP solver uh, works just so much better with these sparse cuts that the number of rounds of cuts that can in the same amount of time is much more. So this is a, this is a figure for the same instance where the red curve is the amount of time I'm, you know, it's taking to solve the LPs uh, and, and the blue curve is for the sparse cuts. And you can see that basically for the sparse cuts, the time kind of remains the same. In fact, there were some instances with the dense cuts, this going up and up and up like that. And, and, and so that really caught, hurt you. Uh, all right, so, so, so that is enough motivation. Uh, I, I want to say that this is, uh, this is not, we are not the first ones to try this. Uh, there's a very nice paper uh, about a couple of years back uh, by Radu uh, Balti and Logugan, uh, uh, Pierre Bonami, Ruth Meissner, and Theresa Mantani, who basically did something similar. In fact, uh, they use machine learning to select these K by K principal sub matrices, very interesting paper. Uh, and in fact, this was tried much earlier by Andrea Kolitsa, Pietro Poletti, Fonso Marco. Uh, you know, trying to solve SDP by uh, sort of cutting planes, you know, you only use an underlying LP solver, uh, but you just uh, try and add as sparse cuts as My interest in this has, you know, you know, of course, we've, we've been working on this paper, but uh, hello, can you still hear me? Because my connection seems to be a little bad. 
Yeah, it was broken up for me, but yeah, it was a little bit for me, but I wasn't oh, sure this. I'm... My network. oh, I'm sorry. Can you? Uh, yeah, is it clear what all? Are? I repeat something. Am I? Uh, uh, please stop me. Uh, let me know if I'm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I should have said that earlier. Please, please stop me. In any case, but if if you can't hear me, let me know, and I will certainly try and repeat. Uh, should. Oh, he's freezing for Hello? me. Um, oh, bummer. But, but I found um, it was frozen for me even before the talk. So um, it might be something on my side as well. No, I, it's freezing for me too, but I, I hear you well, Jane. Oh, OK. OK, OK. So oh, here's what I'm going to do. Maybe I'm just going to let me see. I can, I can, I can, I can. Uh, I can stop my video. Maybe that might help. Uh, and 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 is that better? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. It's for me. Good. Good for me. Okay. Okay. Let's let's let's. Okay. So let's. Uh, apologies. I. I. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, so last few years, I've also been working quite a bit on, on sort of power problem, power, power systems, electrical engineering applications, uh, where you know we observed this phenomena where the SBSD relaxations that we had, SDP relaxations that we had, we could just enforce these uh, PSD nests on these small k by k sub matrices, and 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 we got very good bounds, and we could solve the problems, at, you know. The scale up in sphere time was was huge. Uh, it was people as well, and 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 the next set of citations might be a little bit early, but I'm going to talk about a certain phone in the stock, which is sort of related to these these sparse SDPs, uh, and, and and in fact the dual of this cone is something called as uh, matrices with constant factor width, uh, which has also been studied quite a bit uh, in the sort of uh, uh, polynomial optimization community. So that these are just some references here. So Bowman et al., Perillo, Permenter, Kuvia uh, et al., and 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 for example, these uh, sauce and desauce sort of hierarchies that Amir Ali and co-authors came up with are all sort of related to 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 some of the things that we're talking about. So there are connections and 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 so understanding what. What sort of matrices are, based, uh, are are there? You enforce only, you know, some principal sub matrices to be to be to be to be PSD is is of interest. So, any questions? Oh, are you looking for the chat? I, I didn't receive any question. Okay, all right, very good. So I will, I will, uh, I will move on. Uh, so, 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 so. Uh, okay. So basically, what we want to study is, 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 you know, the comparison between these two problems. This was the original I really wanted to solve, uh, but, uh, but you know, I wanted to solve it in reasonable time, and uh, uh, what I did is I relaxed it. And I said, instead of having the whole matrix to be PSD, uh, I'm going to select some K by K for some matrices and just enforce the PSDness on those principles of matrices. And as I showed you experiments, at least this can be solved much more faster. Uh, even if you, by the way, if you just give them to the solver, sometimes this will solve much faster than this other. But even in this sort of contained framework, you saw that the sparse SDP solves much faster than the original SDP. Uh, but of course, we know if we had sufficient amount of time to solve the SDP, this would be a much better bound to the sparse SDP. And so what we really want to understand is what is the trade-off, right? So we are able to solve the sparse SDP faster, but, 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 but uh, you know, what is the quality of bounds that I can expect to get uh, when I solve this relaxation compared to SDP? So that's, that is sort of the main, main, main question that we want to understand. Um, and, and, and this seems obviously almost impossible to analyze in general, uh, as I stated. And so what we tried to do was to simplify this question. And so what did we do? 
we basically removed most parts of the question, okay? So we said, forget about the optimization problem, all right? And forget about this relaxation. Let's just look at the following thing. Let's just look at the PSD code. And let's look at, let's forget about selecting some principles are minor because I don't know how and how that affects the question for now. Let me just look at matrices where I enforce that all K, K principles are matrices are, uh, are PSD. Okay, this is a cone. This is a closed convex pointed cone, just like the STP cone. This contains the STP cone. And now what I want to is how much bigger is this new cone? So how far is the cone of where I enforce that all K by K matrices are PSD compared to the cone of PSD matrices? Okay, so this is sort of the question that I want to answer in order to understand the more general question about the gaps between these two relaxations. Okay, so let's let's formalize this a little bit. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, talking about of cone uh, of matrices n by n symmetric real matrices, where all the k by k okay my internet connection again makes sense. All the k by k principal sub matrices are PSD, and I'm going to denote this as S and K, and I'm going to call them as the K PSD closure. So K P S D closure, more importantly, I'm going to call them S and K. So N by T is where all K by K principal submetrics are PSD. And as I said, our question is how far is S and K from S and plus? Uh, just to remind you again about this notation, if I plug uh, equals to N, then N is S N plus, okay? And, and, and in general, obviously, S N plus lives in K because if, uh, you know, any matrix in SN plus, it's, it's, it's PSD, but therefore all K by K sub matrices are PSD. All right. So how, how, how should we go about asking this question about how far it is? Well, uh, we have to be a little bit more precise. So, so we have to set a, a few more parameters. Uh, in particular, the way I'm thinking about doing it is I'm thinking of taking matrices in SNK and I'm trying to ask how far are these matrices in SNK from, uh, from, the, from the cone of PSD matrices, okay? So one of the parameters I must decide on is how, what is this metric for measuring this distance? And the other thing I need to do is normalize the question. What do I mean by that? Basically, you know, if, if I have a matrix that is not in the PSD cone, uh, then, you know, in fact, because both of these objects, the, the PSD cone and SN plus uh, are cones, I can just take this vector and just scale it up. It will continue to remain S and K, but it's distant from the PSD cone will increase and go off to infinity. So I kind of have to normalize it, chop off the two cones at some height, make things sort of bounded in order to make this comparison. And so, so, so formally what I do is I define this distance notion. So distance bar of between S and K and S and plus. And what is this distance? Well, this distance is, 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 is the, is this, uh, is, this, is you know, what I do is, I, the way I normalize it is I look at matrices in S and K whose Frobenius norm, right? So just let me quickly remind you, the Frobenius norm of a matrix is nothing but you take the matrix, you imagine it's like a vector uh, with trees and then and just find the, that vector. That's, that's the Frobenius norm. And so that is a way to bound the problem. So I look at matrices that are in S and K with Frobenius norm one, and among these matrices, I search for the one which is the farthest away from the PSD code. And so, and, and the distance again here is mentioned in Frobenius norm. And so those are the two parameters that I'm selecting. And of course, the, the, the distance measured in Frobenius norm of M plus is nothing but the closest matrix in SN plus uh, to your given matrix in the Frobenius norm. All right. Uh, uh, and, 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 and one quick note before we move on, uh, this distance motion is always bounded above by one. So why is that? Because I'm looking at matrices, you know, I've chopped off both these matrices in some, so those, these cones at some, right? At this Frobenius norm one. So if I take any matrix here and its norm is one, notice that the all zeros vector is a PSD matrix. And so, so, so you know, the distance between any M here to the all zeros is, 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 is no more than one. And so therefore the distance is one. But the way to think about this distance is that if the distance is close to zero, then basically this cone is not so much larger than SN plus. Whereas if this distance is one, 
then basically SNK is really much, much, much more larger than SN plus, and maybe your session uh, with SNK is not going to be that good. Okay, this is a good time for me to stop and make sure if if presentation is clear, if 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 there are any questions before I move on. Okay, so I've not. Uh, I've not heard it. Uh, so, so, so I, 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 I'll move on. Uh, I think uh, hopefully the notation. So again, I have SNK, which is the cone of matrices, where I'm enforcing thinness on every k by k principal submatrix, and this cone clearly contains SN plus, the cone of PSD matrices. And I want to know how large is this cone, and 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 we decide, devised ourselves a reasonable way to measure this distance. Okay, so we want to understand how large is SNK. In a sense, we want SNK to be ideally as close as possible to SN plus. And so what we really want is upper bounds on this distance measures. Okay, and so our first uh, few results are sort of upper bounds on this distance SNK and SN plus as a function of N and K. Okay, so our first uh, first result is that, is that, is that, is that, uh, for 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 all, uh, all 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 n greater than equals to two k greater than equals to two, you 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 get a distance uh, uh, up it looks like that. This quantity is between zero and one. It's a little difficult to parse. So uh, one way to, to simplify to understand what's going on is you can approximate. Okay, it says my internet is still. Uh, approximate the denominator by being equal to n. And so then this distance essentially looks something like this, n minus k over n. And so this upper bound is saying that, remember SNK is the same as SN plus when k equals to n. And, 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 and on the other hand, if k was one, then in fact, you know, anything with k equals to two, putting them is sort of growing linearly. So, so for example, Example when k is n, you know this numerator is zero, so this is zero, and in fact, s n k is equal to s n plus, and 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 somehow you know this upper bound is growing linearly. Observed um, uh, uh, is that while this is seems like a reasonable bound, and I'll talk more about why this may or may not be a reasonable bound. Uh, as k gets closer to n, this is not the right bound, or this is not the right order, it seems, and so so so. So when k grows close to n, uh, we were able to prove a up, different upper bound. So this is an upper bound, which of course works for all regimes, but this upper bound is going to be more interesting when k is 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 closer to n. Uh, okay. So again, this is uh, difficult to parse through, but if 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 you if you think of k being very close to n, uh, you know this this term here goes to zero. So and this k square becomes basically n square. So what you have like a, is an n cube term. The square root of that, so that's n to the power three over two, and so basically uh, a simplified version of this 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 formula here, is saying that it's the same bound here n minus k over n to the power. Two. So in other words, as 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 this k gets closer to n, the rate of convergence in some sense of s n k to s n plus is much faster. Okay, so somehow initially it is sort of linear, but as it gets closer, as k gets closer to n. This rate is somehow, you know, it is sort of at the rate of three over two. And as I mentioned, this bound makes sense. It's only interesting when k is really close to n. And 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 let, let me quickly show a figure. So I plotted those two bounds for 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 n equals to twenty. This is k, and this is this distance measure. And you can see that this red one curve here is the first upper bound. Uh, it's not actually linear. You know, we simplified it to sort of look like linear, and 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 this is the second upper bound. And you see that close when k is close to n, uh, this upper bound takes over. Um, okay, so this is sort of the first set of results that we have, uh, and I, I and I'll, I'll try and sketch the the main ideas of the proofs of these two upper bounds uh, in a bit. Uh, but the first question is, how good are these bounds? And so the only way to answer the question is to actually give lower bounds on this quantity, right? And so how would I give lower bounds on this quantity? Well, what I have to do is find matrices in S and K and compute their distances to S and plus, and that gives a lower bound to the upper, you know, uh, on the worst case uh, upper bound, 
and, 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 and so that's how we do it. So let's look at some lower bounds that we have. Uh, so the first lower bound in is, 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 is this, which comes from one particular family of matrices. And again, this formula is a little bit complicated to parse through. So let's, let's, let's work through this a little bit slowly. So if, if, if you take K to be very small, okay, and if you, if you examine the denominator here, this K squared becomes really small. And so you can put the first term. And so really what you're left with is an N square term and there's a square root. And so what you're left with is N minus K over N. And so basically what it says is if K is small, then the first upper bound that we had from theorem one earlier, uh, which said that the upper bound was essentially n minus k over n is very really tight up to some point. Uh, and, and, and there's another interesting regime. If you imagine k to be very large, in fact, let's assume you know, k to be like a constant away from n. And, and, and if you plug that again into this formula here, I notice that this in the denominator, in the denominator, this k is almost equals to n. So this is sort of like an n cube term. And this is a smaller term n squared. So you can ignore that. You take square root n to the power three over two. And, and, and I've assumed k to be n minus k to be essentially a constant. And so you see the rate of convergence is now looking like the second theorem. And so that says that if k is very large, then in fact, our second upper bound is quite good. In fact, if I plot all of these things here, uh, this is what it looks like. So this was the upper bound on distance of S and K from S. This was this upper bound, second upper bound on the distance. This, this green curve here is the slower bound. And as you can see, when K is small, uh, you know, this upper bound is clearly tight. Uh, in fact, it is tight at, at K equals to two. When K is quite large, uh, it is quite tight. In fact, in fact, you can formally prove that it is tight at, at k equals to n minus one. Uh, but the problem is maybe in the center, these two upper bounds are not so good. We, we don't have an example yet to explain that, or at least not, I've not shown you yet. Uh, it seems, as I said, these, the first upper bound is quite good when k is small. The second upper bound is quite good when k is large. And in fact, this is even more uh, serious. This sort of middle region is more a little more serious in the following. If you, if you think that you fix the ratio of n, k over n, all right? So let's say this is, let's say, let's, let's just think of k to be, let's say n over two. So r is 0.5. Well, the upper bound would say that the distance, upper bound on distance is a constant independent of n, okay? But if you plug that into our lower bound, Basically, you get something as a function of r divided by square root of n. And so as n goes off to infinity, this loan that we have will go off to zero, whereas our upper bound would be a constant. And so the question was, oh, maybe our upper bounds are quite good when k is small, quite good when k is large, but we still don't understand what's going on, sort of in this sort of k equals to constant times r regime, all right? And, 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 and it turns out, well, we still don't understand a lot about this regime, but we can come up with a family of instances. And again, here R is quite small, so it's not quite the half that I promised. But if you, you know, the, for some fixed values of R sufficiently small, ratio uh, between K over N, we can construct a family of instances where this distance is a function of, of, of this ratio. And so R depend on N and N of to as n goes off to infinity. So now uh, this term doesn't, now this term doesn't quite look like minus r, we would have liked it to look like, but at least, you know, it says that uh, the upper bounds are somehow reasonable. It is true that somehow this, 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 this constant between k over n might be the right parameter to think about. And there are families where uh, the distance doesn't go off to zero. Off to infinity. Okay, so that was all I want to talk about these bounds. Uh, now, uh, now, now let's talk about one more thing that we observe actually in practice. Now, in practice, 
noticed is that, in fact, we got very good bugs. In fact, that's how we got started on this project is that not only were we doing so well in terms of computational time, the bounds we got were incredibly close to the SDP bounds, which is why we want to understand this question. But of course, you don't add all the, you don't add cuts usually from all these n choose k sub matrices, right? In this. And, 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 and if you think about it, there is so much that you're enforcing that you would assume that maybe you don't need all of these matrices to kind of get the power of SNK, right? You want to simulate SNK, but you probably need N choose K. I mean, N choose K is very large, right? So if so K is, let's say N over two, we're talking about essentially, uh, you know, two to the N in some sense, uh, two to the N cuts. Uh, and so can you be better? And it you can. So, 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 if you have some epsilon and delta, you know, sufficiently small, uh, and then if you look at this quantity here, which basically looks like n square over epsilon square log, n, you know, something that is, you know, for a fixed epsilon and delta, this is essentially let's say no more than say order n cube of these these uh, order n cube. If you basically what you do is you sample uniformly uh, these k subsets, okay. Uh, M of these guys. So let me say that again. You have this number looks like order n cube, and then what you do is you take your you take your matrices, and then you sample order M of k subsets. Then you construct this random cone, where you enforce the PSD ness only on these random subsets. These M of these random M was n cube then what you can show is that with high probability, so probability one minus delta, the distance of this random cone, this SN plus in the same, in the same distance metric that we've defined earlier is, is basically no more than this, this green term here was exactly our upper bound, earlier upper bound. So one plus epsilon times that, okay? And, and, and in some sense, this, this result reflects what we observe in, in practice that we don't really have to add cuts from all of these, 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 these sub matrices, you know, adding a reasonable number of them seems to really help. And this is not very surprising. I mean, imagine yourself, if you had like a by 10 matrix and, you know, you're, yes, uh, if, you, if you really wanted to get SN5, you have to enforce the PSD-ness on every five by five principal sub matrix. But imagine yourself, you, take, you see that adding just enough of them puts enough structure in there that you shouldn't be too far away from SN, SN, SNK. And, and that is somehow uh, reflected in this result. So this is again, a very good time for me to kind of quickly stop. And, 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 and I have, I think another few minutes, so I think I should be able to discuss a little bit about uh, the main ideas in the proof. But before I do that, any questions about the results? Okay. Uh, I, 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 uh, I'm assuming, hello, you can still hear me. <laughs> uh, my apologies again for this poor internet connection. Uh, okay, but it looks like, okay, good, very good, thank you. And so I assume there are no questions, so I move on. All right, so how do we, uh, let's, let's, let's quickly discuss proof ideas that we use. Uh, uh, all right, so the first upper bound uh, is this, uh, this upper bound here. And how do we obtain this upper bound? Uh, so here's the main observation. So, so we have this matrix X in SNK. What does it mean? So in this picture, I have N is equals to one, two, three, four, five, K is three. It means that every three by three principal sub matrix is PSD. What I can do is I can take such a matrix, I can fix a three by three sub matrix, principal sub matrix, and I can just zero out all the other entries. It's an easy thing to see is that the resulting matrix is actually now a PSD matrix because this 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 non-zero part is PSD, and now here's the here's what we do: we take each of these matrices that come from zeroing out. Essentially, you look at every k by k principal sub matrix and zero out everything else, and then you take the average of these n choose k uh, matrices. Now, since each of these matrices are in SN plus, the average is in SN plus. But it turns out when you do this average in this way, the resulting matrix looks very much like X. In fact, you can rescale this new average matrix such that all the off-diagonal entries would be exactly the same as the original matrix. 
and just the diagonal entries will be scaled up a little bit from X, okay? That's true. But essentially what you get is matrix that looks very much like X and, 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 and is in the PSD code. And then you can actually in closed form compute the distance between them. And this obviously gives you a distance between SN plus and SNK. And this is precisely uh, this formula, okay? All right. The proof of the second upper bound is a little bit more interesting. I should mention uh, the, 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 the results that I'm mentioning in this paper, uh, this talk are part of two papers. And, 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 and in the first paper, we actually had slightly something that is weaker. And this, the second upper bound is, is, is for the second, second paper where we, we strengthen that result. Uh, so let, let, let's talk about how we uh, uh, update this upper bound. Uh, the first idea, the first idea is, is this uh, very interesting uh, theorem uh, called the interlace theorem. What does this say? Uh, <coughs> this says is if you take a uh, you take a matrix, let's take a symmetric matrix, uh, so, uh, and, 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 and you remove one row and column uh, from this matrix, right? So let's say I remove the third row and corresponding the third column from this PSD matrix. Uh, what is it? It says something about the eigenvalues of the matrix. In particular, it says they're interlaced. What do I mean by that? So imagine I have a five by five matrix, right? Uh, and, and, and these are my eigenvalues from smallest to largest. So what are the new eigenvalues are interlaced. So I get four new eigenvalues that are somehow in between. So the smallest one of the new guy is interlaced between the first, the smallest guy and the next guy of the and so forth. And so, 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 uh, okay, okay. Uh, so if you uh, take Cauchy's interlaced theorem, you apply it a sufficient number of times so that you start from the n by n matrix and land to the k by k. Now the k by k matrix is, is PSD. So that tells you something about the sign pattern of the eigenvalues of the big matrix. And what you can argue is that there are no more than n minus k negative eigenvalues for matrices in SNK. All right, good. Now, how do I measure the distance between a matrix uh, in SNK and SN plus using this Frobenius norm? Well, that is nothing but you take the negative eigenvalues of your matrix in SNK, and you think of that as a vector uh, of values, and you take the two norm of that. That is precisely the Frobenius distance. And so, so therefore, uh, I get the following upper bound. What I can do is I take the absolute value of the most negative eigenvalue of M. Uh, where M is a matrix in, 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 in SNK. Now I know that M, because of this uh, inter Cauchy's interlaced theorem, there can be only N minus K of these negative values. And so I can just multiply this number by square root of N minus K, and this will be an upper bound on, these, uh, on this distance. And so in principle, this is the quantity that I'm interested in, square root N minus K times minimize the smallest eigenvalue of M you know, I'm taking absolute values, such that a Frobenius norm of, uh, of M is one and M is in SNK. So what I would like to do, the way I would like to deal with this problem is I would really like to write in the space of eigenvectors, eigenvalues, pardon me, sort of, you know, in n-dimensional problem. Uh, uh, I, 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 the first condition is easy, right? The Frobenius norm being one is the same as saying that the two norm of the eigenvalues is, 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 is no more than, I'm trying to minimize the smallest uh, entry in this, this vector here. But the problem is I still have to, I still have this constraint and I have to enforce this constraint. The most important is that this M is an SNK. So if I can take this condition and somehow write this as a condition on the eigenvalues of matrices, that might that might give me an appropriate upper bound, and that might give me this problem that I might be able to analyze. All right, so 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 you know we are doing what we would have to do anyways in 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 studying something like this is to look at these matrices S and K and try to understand what their eigenvalues look like. All right. So I'm going to use this notation as a restriction to S as saying that if you take M and you yourself principal some matrix S the restricted matrix, okay? Uh, and, and, and so by definition, okay, if, if, if you take restrictions of psi k for matrices in SNK, 
then these restrictions are PSD. This is the very definition of, of, of matrices in SNK. All right, so what can we do? Uh, okay, so examine this quantity, okay, that I call as CKM. This quantity is the sum of all the determinants of of, 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 of these k by k principal sub matrices. In other words, all the k by k minors of this matrix M, I, I, I add them up. Now I know that each of them individually is non-negative because it's PSD, this determinant is non-negative. When I add non-negative quantities, what I get is something that's non-negative. Very good. It turns out this quantity here, which is this, this sum of this k, all k by k minors, can also be written in a different way. And what is that? Uh, let me pass through this, 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 this uh, uh, expression. You take all your eigenvalues of M, take K distinct uh, eigenvalues, okay? Uh, well, I mean distinct entries, the, the eigenvalues could be repeated. Just pick sort of K entries of this vector, multiply them, multiply them, and then add this over all possible of, of you know, all K subsets. And this quantity is exactly equals to CK, CKM. I mean, this is a well-known well -known equation. Uh, uh, this, this, this expression, this normal in terms of the eigenvalues is called as the elementary symmetric, is, is, is the elementary symmetric polynomial, sometimes denoted as E and K. So, so, so what you're saying is E and K of the eigenvalues is precisely equals to CKM which is the sum of these all k by k, uh, k by k uh, minors. And, 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 and uh, this is the relation, but usually people tend to use like the extreme versions of this. So when, when for example, uh, the size of S is one, uh, this is nothing but the of, of the uh, diagonal entries of the matrix N and, and, and this term is nothing but essentially, so that's the trace and this is nothing essentially the sum of the eigenvalues and we know that that is equal. When, 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 when K is equals to N, uh, this is nothing but just the determinant of the matrix N and, 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 and this is nothing but the product of all the eigenvalues, which we know is equal to the determinant. So we tend to use the, the extreme versions, but you know, this is a well-known expression. But okay, all of the story to say what? It's to say the following. Now what we know is that if M is in S and K, then this elementary symmetric polynomial of the eigenvalues of matrix M is non-negative. Now notice this is an expression in the eigenvalues. So I could take this expression and, and, and plug it in here. And now I have an optimization problem in only these eigenvalues, okay? We will do something like that, almost, not quite. It turns out while this is, this is, this is quite useful, we can say something more about these eigenvalues in the space of these eigenvalues. And let's try and understand this. Okay. All right. So what would we just say here? That CMK is nothing but the elementary symmetric polynomial evaluated for the eigenvalues, which is non-negative. But if you, if you take this vector of eigenvalues and you add a positive number T, Add positive number t to each of the entries of the eigenvalues, and you compute its uh, its elementary symmetric polynomial. It's it's straightforward to see that this is nothing but you know compute so, uh, adding all k by k minors of a matrix where I take the matrix M, and I just increase the uh, each of the diagonal values by this 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 number t, and so each of the k by k k by k uh, sub matrices will be uh, definite matrix. So their definite, their determinants will be positive, and so 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 in fact this quantity will be positive. Okay. All right. So what does this say? There's a difference. Take this, and 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 and, and we'll slow. I'll slowly pass through this. This first bullet point, this observation, can be rewritten in the following fashion. Can be rewritten in the following fashion. Okay. If I take this vector of eigenvalues. I take this vector of eigenvalues and I take the all ones vector and I look at the line segment between these two, okay? If I take the line segment between these two, it turns out that this line completely belongs to the following set. What is the set? You look at the elementary symmetric polynomial, okay? And you look at the Rn, 
you look at Rn, where this elementary polynomial is not zero. Okay, what 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 it's easy to see is that what it does is it divides Rn into connected components. Okay, in one connect component, you know this this value might be positive. In some components, this value would be negative. Uh, there will be more than there will be multiple these connected components. Uh, there is one component which contains the all ones vector where this elementary symmetric polynomial is positive. And notice that anywhere in this line set, the eigenvalues and the all one vectors, you know, if I compute this elementary symmetric polynomial, it's positive. And so in other words, this observation is saying that this line segment completely belongs to the connected component of Rn minus, you know, this, the root of symmetric polynomials, the, the connected component that contains the vector one. So that's a mouthful to say, uh, uh, but all of that uh, uh, can be stated in, in one, one, that essentially this line segment belongs to what is called as the hyperplicity cone of the elementary polynomial with respect to the vector one, which is often denoted as H, E, and T. Okay? And so all of what we've discussed here uh, put it sushitly is saying, if I have a matrix M and S and K, if you look at, if you look at vector of its eigenvalue, this vector here lives in this hyperbone elementary symmetric polynomial. And why is this observation better than what we got in the previous slide? Because it's something that is stronger. So it turns out, you know, as I said, there are various components where, 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 where you would have that this ENK is strict zero. And so it turns out the set of points in Rn where this elementary symmetric polynomial is greater than equal to zero actually strictly larger than the hyperplicity cone. And what is more important is very important for the analysis we do is it is well known that this cone is a convex set. Okay. And, and, and the students, uh, they have to start this, this sort of stuff to me recently in the last two, three months. And so let me just, uh, you know, since this is new to me, let me just show a couple of examples. Uh, I, I'm sure that, you know, many people already know very well what hyperplicity cone is. Let me just quickly show one or two examples to, 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 to explain this hyperplicity cone one more time. It might simplify what's going on. So, so we are interested in H, H of E and K, where of course a K is strictly less than N, but just to understand these two properties, let's look at a, a, a simple example where, where which that I can plot where N is two and K is two, okay? So well, in that case, this elementary symmetry polynomial is X1, X2. And this original set that we had said that, oh, two is greater than equals to zero. And you know, this is obviously the this this non-negative orthant and this other sort of symmetric orthant where both x1 and x2 are less than equal to zero. On the other hand, the way to think about the this hype, uh, he22 that's a type of I mean, he22 the hyperplicity cone of the elementary symmetric polynomial. Well, when is it that x1 and x2 equals to zero? The roots of this polynomial are clearly the the y-axis and the x-axis. So it does is it divides R2 into four components. So this one, this one, this one, and this one. And this component contains the vector, all ones vector. And so the hyperplicity cone is essentially just this part here, just the non-negative author. And you see automatically that this is a smaller set than this set here. And in fact, this set is convex. And so that's, that's what those two properties are. And that's why, uh, you know, this implication is a much better implication and this, and, and uh, at this point in time, I, uh, okay, I've run out of time, okay? So, so I, 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 I will not go into more details. I will just say here that we take this M, A, we replace it with, with this relaxation that says that this eigenvalue is, is the hypocrisy cone. Now this is a convex problem. In 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 in, in, in a lot of symmetry. We can analyze this in closed form, and that's how we get our second upper bound. Uh, I will actually. I think this might. Uh, I've already run uh, run over time. My apologies uh, by a minute. So I'm going to stop here and 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 take questions. Uh, 
Hi, this is Steve Avasis. Can I ask a question? Yes. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Oh, fine. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, what's the uh, known about the complexity of testing membership in SNK or equivalently? It is. It, it, has a K it is. It is. It is NP complete. It is NP hard. Sorry. It's NP hard. NP hard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it. I can tell you that basically what you can do is show that this is. Uh, it is equivalent to it, 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 it's equivalent to solving the sparse PCA problem, mm -hmm. which is basically saying, given a mat, uh, uh, in fact, given a PSD matrix, uh, find uh, find a k by k sub matrix uh, whose largest eigenvalue is maximized. So find that number. Uh, okay, so that that that, that and, and and this is polynomially equivalent uh, to checking membership. So so yes, as a in principle, is not great to work with, but it does work well in practice. Uh, in fact, uh, just to answer to put uh, to answer your question in some sense relating it to the computations, uh, you know, when we when we get these sparse cuts to solve this NP hard problem, but there are some fantastic heuristics that the machine learning community has come up with to solve the sparse PCA problem. So we use the machine learning heuristics to solve the uh, spa, uh, sparse PCA problem, which is used to separate these sparse cuts that we add. Okay, thank, thank you. Shantanu. Uh, uh, yes. I was wondering, uh, so for example, in the special case of SOCP cones, obviously right. whatever you have applies there, but is there anything more that, that can be said in that case? I'm not so in a sense, uh, well, the connection is that actually when K equals to two, right? Yeah. Uh, this becomes the, this classical SOCP relaxation. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. Okay, so it's just saying that every two by two sub matrix in your matrix is, P is PSD, that's precisely the SOC relaxation. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, yes, from a theory point of view, our upper bound is not great, right? You know, the bound is like basically nothing then. So of course, in the worst case, yeah, it, it does not reflect what we see in practice. In some ex uh, applications that I don't have here, but if you look at uh, some of this work that people have done in power systems, like we have some pay papers with others as well, uh, you know, just enforcing the two by two principle sub matrices, is, okay, of course, speeds up amazingly well, because now you're solving SOCPs uh, rather than SDPs, but the bounds are really close to the SDP bound. Not the, not the same, but quite close. And, 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 and maybe the, another connection uh, is that, you know, there's this uh, hierarchies that uh, Amir Ali uh, has 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 come up with, which is you know replacing the SDP with the LP and 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 and, and these only dominant uh, uh, what does he call them something called as DSOS. It turns out that cone of matrices that he uses that he calls as DSOS is nothing but the dual of this SN two, and so that 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 they relate. Really Thanks. Yeah. Um, other questions? Maybe I'll just just uh, just like uh, uh, right to the end. Thing about uh, uh, good thing about these talks is that you see I'm going fast, but you can slow down and read all the slides and all the proofs, and I'm sure some of you are reading it as I go. But I wanted to thank you and, 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 and put those references. Uh, so those are the papers that the talk is based on. Thank you uh, for the nice talk. Thank um, you very much for the invitation. Yeah, so I can stop other... sharing. Maybe. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Um, so, so maybe I misunderstood something, but um, um, 
uh, I guess the, the original problem was to try to um, relax this um, PSD um, mm -hmm. restriction to, to sparse K PSD. And then you, mm -hmm. you check the Frobenius um, distance between these two sets of matrices. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, from the, the result of the lower bound, well, actually the upper bound too, but maybe lower bound, should I, should I view this result as more like negative results in that sense? Because yeah, so in a sense, it does not completely explain. Uh, okay, my internet is bad here, so I'll just wait for a second. Good, now, uh, uh, you're right. Yeah, ideally, it would have been great if I could explain what we observe in practice. And it does not explain. So obviously, it means that there's a lot more structure that are there in these power problems or some other applications, you know, like the one I showed, is making this SNK relaxation quite good. Cool. Uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, maybe this result was of some interest, which showed that you know you don't need. Okay, I think he probably jumped out of the network. He looks frozen. Yeah. <clears throat> what do we do? I guess he may come back. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah dropped out, I guess, completely. So he didn't say anything about uh, applications to chordal structure. I didn't hear him say anything. But that's sort of, um, if you're gonna solve large sparse SDPs and they're chordal, then essentially what you do is you, you restrict to the Principal sub matrices that exist in the sparse yeah. structure. Uh, sorry, yeah. my internet went out completely for a second. Yes, yeah. but but I don't know how much you heard my answer. But I was just saying that yes, I I could not complete the whole cycle. I would have loved to say that oh, theory explains everything we see in practice. Does it? But I mean, uh, in practice, really much better for some places of problems. Is all uh -huh, I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. So there's probably more structure of this, those problems that we don't still know. That's making it work. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think there are probably quite a few other people still want to ask questions, especially Henry. Um, okay. but, but I believe Santuna is going to stay for um, a, a while, right? After this talk. Um, yeah, I can hang out for a bit, yes. So maybe let me just... Uh, uh, finish this seminar and then we can leave um, uh, time to for more discussions and I can stop recording. Uh, okay. So thank you very much for giving this nice talk. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> so, <you. laughs> that is lot.